Battle of Towton on Palm Sunday 1461 has gone down in history as the bloodiest battle ever to take place on English soil. When the fighting stopped on that snowy day with the Yorkist Edward IV victorious over his Lancastrian rival Henry VI, it was reported that 28,000 men lay dead. So what made this particular battle so ferocious? I'm Matt Lewis, a medieval historian, and I've come to North Yorkshire where the battle took place to uncover the real story of Towton. In the last episode, I took a tour of the battlefield to discover how the day was won and what happened to the men who lost. This time, I'll learn about the terrifying final moments of some of the soldiers who died there, looking closely at skeletons found in a mass grave on the site of the battle. I'll be getting hands-on with everything from medieval maces to pole axes, matching the shocking injuries on these bones with the 15th century weapons that caused them. First, I'm meeting Dr Joe Buckbury of the University of Bradford, who's been studying what these bones can tell us for years. So these are some skulls of individuals who died at the Battle of Towton on Palm Sunday in 1461. And we can see, I think, on some of these remains, the ways that they died, the kind of brutal injuries that people were suffering that day. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was a mass grave excavation. There was just 36 people, maybe 38 people, um, based on duplication of elements and the like. And um, they've all got evidence of injuries that happened to them on the Battle of Towton. Um, and some of them also have injuries from prior battles as well. It's incredibly rare to find bones from any medieval battle, so the discovery of a mass grave at Towton in 1996 promised to revolutionise our understanding of the battle. When archaeologists were looking for confirmation that these men died violent deaths, it wasn't hard to find. So what can this skeleton tell us, for example, about how this person died? Yep, yeah, OK, so what we've got here is um, a big sword injury running across the side of the cranium and you can see that's that's a really big injury and um, that that would be also impacting on the brain and then on the back we've also got a little arrow injury um in here as well so you know we see multiple injuries in a huge number of these individuals to show me the weapons that were on display at towton and how they were used i'm speaking to wayne reynolds of the fry company Hello Wayne, great to meet you. Uh, clearly a man I want to stay on the right side of. This is a pretty okay. frightening array of weapons here. Uh, so we were able to go to the University of Bradford and see the, the skeletons of some of those who lost their lives at Towton and see the injuries that were inflicted on them. So what do we think would have sliced out pieces of people's skull? Things that slice out people's skull are the sword blades. Uh, so this is, it's, it's a long sword. It's effectively a two-handed weapon, but it could be used one-handed as well. But on a battlefield, it's kind of got limited use if you're fighting against other soldiers in armour, because armour's really, really good defence against cutting and slashing weapons. The only way that they were working out how to get through armour is a technique called half-sword in which they would grasp the blade with their gauntleted hands and use it like an elongated dagger. So this was your delivery hand here, and this was your guiding hand here. And they would target the weak points in the armor. So underneath the armpits, into the elbows, into the wrists, into the neck. And what we also refer to as the lower openings. <laughs> Not all the injuries on these individuals were caused by sharp, slashing weapons like a sword. Others relied on brute force. And I think this skull also has a, a fairly stark indication Absolutely. of how this person was killed. Yeah, so, I mean, it's fairly obvious, really. You've got this huge square hole on the side of the head, and so sort of this is where the ear would be just to the back, so it's kind of up on the temple. Um, it's a very square hole, and it was uh, matched to weapons in the Royal Armouries um, as being consistent with a medieval war hammer. 
just basically a hammer that you take to war and hit people around the head with. Yeah, so the um, things that normally go, they go to kind of to a point. To a point. So someone's driven that. And that's driven in, and it's been driven skull. in far enough to create a hole of this dimension. So that gives you an idea of the length and the depth of that injury. But it wasn't just this injury for this person. He also suffered a really catastrophic fracture, which is what we call a ring base fracture. So there's actually the center of the skull around here has come away that normally you have a hole just about here, the frame and magnum, that's where your spinal cord comes out. This person has been hit on the top of the head with such force that their spine has compressed up into their skull and it's caused this fracture around that hole, but also further fractures to radiate up through the back. And then in this case, it's actually bisected the ear hole and come up through the bone. I think these all just demonstrate the brutality. Yeah, incredibly brutal the, things. The horrendous ways that people were dying yeah, during yeah. the Battle of Towton. Let's see if Wayne has been able to identify the weapon that caused this wound. ...and see the injuries that were inflicted on them. In particular, there was one skull that had a small square mark in the side of it. What do you think might have caused that injury? We think, and, and it's almost a match to, to this... It's, the, it, it's, it's kind of uncanny, just, just kind of how close it is. And this is what I like to refer to as the Swiss army knife of medieval weapons, because it's got everything that you need. You get a hook here called a bec de corban or a crow's beak. The hammerhead here. Here we see an extended stud there. That's the focus of the blunt force trauma. You notice as well that the hammerhead isn't flat because when you're striking somebody in armour, you don't want that blow to slide off. You want that blow to stay where it hits and transmit that blunt force trauma in the direction that you're projecting it. By the time the Battle of Towton took place, the Wars of the Roses had been raging for six years. Some of the men found in the grave at Towton show signs of having survived earlier violent encounters. This is one of the individuals who's got injuries from a prior battle. So you can see across here we've got this sort of linear depression and um, this is a sword injury that is healed, the edges are really rounded. And then next to it we've got another sword injury in here um, which is very fresh. So this is one that happened at Towton. And this one's from a prior battle. Wow, so he's had a sword across the top, top of his head. head. Smack bang across the top of his head. Healed. Yeah, I mean, the important thing here is it's not gone all the way through the bone. So um, that reduces the chance of having internal injury. I mean, that, that could still cause internal hemorrhage and so on, but it's not direct blade into brain, um, which obviously is a significantly more serious injury. And then at Titan, he case, suffered something very close very, to it. Very close to it and very similar. And th this is an injury that you could easily survive as you can see from here. And he's got another one on, on the forehead that's even more shallow, again, from the Battle of Towton. Um, and another one across the side of his head. So this one's coming in just kind of halfway through the ear. Um, and if we move him round, we then see three sort of square rectangular punctures to the top of the head. These are all um, perimortem, so around the time of death. And in these cases, they're probably from the top spike of a pole axe. Wow. To think of, of him walking around with sword cuts to the head and blood yeah. pouring down his face, still fighting. Still fighting, yeah. Until he gets a pole yeah. axe through his skull. Yes. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty horrific it evidence is, it of is the really, brutality really of the brutal, day. Really brutal um, injuries that we see. The pole axe doesn't sound all that sophisticated, but as Wayne can demonstrate, by this period, it was the weapon of choice for the best trained knights. So here you kind of see the big brother of this one. And it's, it's, it's exactly the same configuration. So you have the Bec de Corban here, the hook. You have the hammerhead here with the coronets. So here you see three focus points for that blunt force trauma. You get the spike at the top and you get the spike at the bottom. So there are fight manuals on how to use a polax. So they're nearly always used with what we call the Q end first. These are used to parry and block and thrust. And it's not until your opponent's weapons out of the way is when the business end comes into play. So 
These become really, really versatile weapons and these become knightly weapons. You don't see poor people using poleaxes. It's, it's kind of like the, it's, it's knights only really. But at Towton, as well as the arrow injury, we've got evidence of a trauma to the side of the skulls where he's been hit to the side and that side has, has kind of crumpled inwards. So you get a series of fractures around that point of impact. It's startling how many of these didn't suffer one wound that Absolutely. has killed them, but Absolutely. they've been repeatedly hit again and again and again. Yeah. In any one of which might have killed you, but people have been keeping hitting Absolutely. And, and this is kind of, you're looking at Towton as being towards the end of a period of multiple battles and there are grudges being played out. There's an idea of, of no quarter should be given. And so it, it's very, very brutal. Of course, Towton's quite a rarity in terms of archaeology. We don't find many collections of skeletons like this. So we don't know if this was typical for the medieval period, but it is particularly brutal when you start thinking about how it impacted these people. And we saw some people who had suffered more like crushing injuries. So I guess that's coming from something more like the ends of one of these. It's coming from more, more like the ends of one of these or from the mace. And, and these, are, these are not subtle weapons. It's kind of like there's- It's a lump of metal on a metal stick. It's a lump stick. of metal on a end of stick. There's only one use for these, but you can see that the, this particular example has all these flanges on. And this is, again, to make sure that that blunt force trauma stays where you're landing the blow so that the mace isn't sliding off the armor. Uh, and yeah, these, these are quite a weight, really, um, and would certainly produce those sort of like crushing blows, definitely breaking bones, definitely causing blunt force trauma. If you hit somebody hard enough, you can even rupture internal organs. So they're, they're pretty devastating weapons, really, um, and, and not to be underestimated. The devastating fatal injuries suffered by these men in their final moments is shocking enough, but there's also evidence of other types of wounds that drive home the human side of what happened that day. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the arm bones of the skeleton. Um, so this is the humerus, the upper arm bone, and you can see a cut running through the elbow, it's fractured up into the sort of shaft of the bone. And from the back, you can see just how straight that cut is, suggesting it's something like a sword so that's that his caused left it. Elbow so that's his left outside. elbow to the outside, yep. And we actually know that his arm was, uh, was probably somewhat bent when this happened, because you actually have the um, radius that sits on top of it has also been cut by the same blow. So it implies he was hit with his arm somewhere up here and the sword's yeah. come down. Yeah, absolutely. So his arm is up in the air and it's hitting him through the elbow whilst the elbow is, is flexed. But we do know that he um, has another sort of typical defensive injury and that's on the opposite side. Um, so this one is his right ulna and you can see there is a break to the distal part and the texture and colour tells us this happened around the time of death. And this location is absolutely classic of what we call a parry fracture. Um, and a parry fracture is basically when you lift your arm up to, to protect your face, it's the ulna that's, that's here um, that then gets the blow and is most likely to fracture. So that's both his arms. I mean, we've got no way of knowing what order that happened in, but at some no. point he's been caught across the left elbow, tried to parry a, a blow with his right arm and been fractured here. I mean, there. yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of this one, because it's just a fracture, all of the soft tissue is still intact. It wasn't necessarily bleeding. Um, it probably would have been quite disabling in terms of pain. Um, but at this point, I think they're just, they're fighting through that. Um, whereas in this side, obviously this is a sharp edged injury. It's, it's gone through the bone, but also through the soft tissue and the blood vessel. So this is something that would have bled quite a lot. And you don't know to what extent it's also impacted on the soft tissue and things like the muscles, the tendons, the nerves even. And I was also particularly struck by one of the skeletons that we saw that kind of really brought home the humanity and the brutality of what went on at Towton. And it's someone who has cuts on their forearms from defensive wounds, so holding their arms up to defend themselves. Presumably that's going to be something like a sword. It, it, it probably is going to be a sword. The common sword that you would see, and these are popular from kind of like the 11th century onwards, 
They're kind of like Norman design with a wheel pommel, cross guard here, both edges there and sharp at the tip. So the idea with, with an arming sword is that you can stab with it, you can cut with it, like this. So it becomes a very, very versatile weapon, often used in conjunction with a buckler. And these, these are popular these are popular throughout Europe. These are your secondary weapons for, and it's close combat stuff, um, because the idea is that this buckler here is protecting your hands here. It's, it's a handy little weapon system. Knights were taught this. Poor men, referred to as the ordinary fencer, had different techniques and would have probably used them separate like this, using blows and like this terrifying as i keep saying it's frightening how much thought goes into ways to to maim and kill other human beings in a medieval battle and and to relate these to those skeletons of those who lost their lives at Towton is is fascinating and, and horrific the last individual joe shows me throws up some surprises too he was another veteran of earlier battles and what can our final skeleton on this last table tell us about Towton? Okay, so we know that Towton is one of many battles in the War of the Roses, and this is one of the people who, again, may have fought in a previous battle, certainly fought in a previous battle. Um, so if we look at his mandible, you can see this sword injury across the side of the face, but it's got rounded edges, it's all healed. So this is somebody who survived a previous injury. So that's the bottom part of his left jaw. So at some yeah. point he's had a sword wound kind of yeah, across the chin. Yeah, directly across the chin. Yeah, but he's survived. Side of, the, side of the chin. Yeah, and he survived that. And yeah, absolutely. And it's healed and it's got no evidence of infection in that. It's healed really well um, given the severity of the injury and the time period when that happened. And then also we have on his upper jaw, his maxilla, this sword injury that's basically running diagonally across his face. And this is one that happened perimortem, so at Towton. So he's had another sword wound, sort of perpendicular to the other one. Yes, almost. Coming down yeah. his face. Come down his face. At Towton. At Towton, and and this is a you know that's a really severe injury, a facial injury. And do we know what kind of age this person might have yeah, been? Yeah, I mean he's one of the older individuals um, from the Battle of Towton. Uh, we know that he was probably over the age of forty-five when he died. Unfortunately, we don't have an upper end of that because age estimation techniques are not that brilliant at looking at older people. Um, given he was obviously an active fighter, he probably wasn't in his eighties or nineties. Um, but he was, you know, could well have been in his late forties, fifties, possibly even his sixties. So this is a veteran of previous battles, bearing the scars of those previous experiences, who has gone to Towton knowing full well what that kind of Knew exactly what he was getting involved. into, yeah, yeah. And he hasn't survived this one. No, He's received no. wounds, not dissimilar to the ones he survived before. But in but this case, the were fatal, yeah. And I Absolutely. think all of these really show the, the absolute brutality that was on display at Towton. The amount of damage that was done to each of these people around the times of their death is it's staggering it's really staggering and you know it, it, it's startling to see multiple injuries on each individual and you know there are skeletons that just have one injury but there are others that have injury after injury after injury so you know this is a really brutal fight Towton is framed as the bloodiest battle ever to take place on English soil perhaps it was perhaps it wasn't Whatever the scale of the battle and the number of the dead, walking the battlefield, seeing the weapons involved at work and the marks they left on the dead really brings home just how terrifying a medieval battlefield could be. Towton wasn't the end of the Wars of the Roses. More battles were fought over the next quarter of a century, but Towton seared itself into the national consciousness in 1461. It brutally set neighbour against neighbour and put families on a bloody collision course. Towton was considered an apocalyptic moment. It's not hard to see why. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.